right, I think we are ready to start. Uh, we'll be starting on time. Um, so welcome everybody. We'll give a, I'll be giving a talk introducing you to um, the new geometry functionality of uh, Mathematica 10. And um, first half, I'm going to try to give you the whole picture of how it all fits together, the flows and the workflows. And then the last half, we do some exploration where we use it a little bit more. And there are several more talks in this conference that covers various aspects of it. So um, the big picture of what's happening, the things that are in geometry, is uh, regions. So there are many ways to create regions. Um, they can use numbers, parameters, formulas, even graphics and, and other things, or, or uh, geometry defined in various file formats and so on, to create regions. From regions, there are various things that we compute, properties, you know, like area and volume and distances and stuff. And there's a whole slew of solvers. But to just keep this sort of simple my, you know, picture in mind, and we'll get um, through this pretty easily. If we break it down a little bit more, um, we have four kinds of, uh, of regions. We have basic regions or special regions. These are things like ball and disk and line and, uh, and so on. We have something we call formula regions. These are things that are defined by formulas, like implicit conditions that set up a region, or parametric formulas that define a region. Then we have uh, mesh-based regions, and there are two basic types. They're, they're complete, sort of full, detailed mesh regions. And there's what's called boundary mesh representation, where you give a, like a polygon, where you give a boundary curve or a boundary surface. And then there's something else which is called derived regions, which, use, which are built from other regions. So like a Boolean combination of things is an example of a derived region of transforming a region, and there are, there are lots of them. <coughs> Different kinds, there are four kinds of uh, properties. Dimension stuff is very important for determining many things with regions. Membership, moments. Moments is things like area um, and centroid, distances, and then there's uh, uh, five different kinds of solvers, visualization solvers, integration solvers, optimization solvers, equation solvers, and PDE solvers that operate on regions. Okay, so let's start the tour. So a region is simply a point set of Rn. So all of our regions are embedded in some space, Rn. And in Mathematica, concretely, anything that's region Q uh, is a region. So basic regions, they're simple and common, specified with a few parameters, like ball, formula regions, formulas. Here's a simple example. Um, they're really flexible, but they get kind of complicated, too. Um, but they're exact, and you can get exact results. Uh, Mesh-based regions are very flexible, particularly the sort of as a ways of approximating regions. Um, they're specified with points and cells. Here's a typical region, here's a volume region, where you have a collection of, of uh, volume cells, in this case, tetrahedra. Um, these can be in any dimension. You know, they can be line curves in, in 3D and so on. They, they don't have to be full dimensional. Derived regions, they're very flexible, and allows you to sort of derive, derive new ones from old, so like a union. OK, so let's look at some examples. So here are some basic regions or special regions. So geometry works perfectly well in 1D, in which case we have point, line, and interval. 2D, we've, we've effectively doubled. So almost all the things that are graphics primitives before are now also geometry, special or basic geometric regions. But beyond that, we've doubled the number of such primitives uh, in 2D and 3D. And so there are, there are now unbounded regions, like a half line or an infinite line. There are other things that are more sort of high schoolish, which is you know side 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 triangle, those kinds of things, um, and and so on. Likewise, in 3D, you have some of the same things, but you have you know half plane, infinite plane. There are new unbounded ones, and you have various cells like parallelepiped and hexahedra, prisms, and so on, and very general things like conic holes. Um, and uh, a lot of these special regions work perfectly well in any dimension, in, in n-dimensional space. It's, it's kind of silly to restrict yourself to 3D in Mathematica, it's just, or just full-dimensional 3D. It just looks 
arbitrary and silly, you know. <clears throat> Although it's a very, very important case, so don't get me wrong, you know. <laughs> but it's just... <laughs> um, okay, so let's run through some... I forgot to delete the outputs here, so you're going to see it. You know, here's an implicit region. Um, and, and you see that there are two types. One is that we give a condition. You guys that um, have been using Mathematica and using region plot and other things have gotten used to this. And if you integrate using bool with conditions, you've gotten used to this and you've, you've, you've probably already well warmed up. This is a way to represent it as a region and to be able to compute with it as a geometric object very cleanly and combine with everything else. Parametric region, just what you think. It's kind of like parametric plot. It has one more case, uh, you know, which you can give a condition here, like a P condition for your parameter space. For those folks who come from the CAD industry, these would be called trimmed regions, where you give conditions on the parameter space. Um, and here is kind of like a hello world case, like being a, can you integrate over it? And so I'm just doing that to show it's, it's, it's a real region. So this also indicates another thing that I want to integrate over a region. This is a 2D region. This is a symbolic vector variable and says, like, you know, X is in that region and just integrate mm -hmm. over it. 3D1. Um, hello world case again. And um, so that is implicit or formula based regions. Now, mesh based regions, um, they are, I'm going to sort of show two, two things here. One is that so a mesh-based region is basically a disjoint union of cells. And so the case that you probably all intuitively have in mind is like a triangulated surface. That's a really good case. So that's a disjoint union of triangles. But they can be any kind of, of piecewise linear cells. Um, and they can be in any dimension. So a curve with line segments in 3D is a perfectly good mesh region. So... Um, uh, the other one, which is boundary mesh region, they, they can, um, they're a little bit more compact. They're like polygon. You only represent the boundary mesh for it. So in, in 1D, it's two points. In 2D, it's a curve. And in 3D, it's a closed and oriented surface that you have to specify to give those. And it works perfectly well in ND2. Not for us right now, but the, the theory <laughs> it will generalize. OK. So here's an example. For those of you who have used graphics complex, you can see this is the same idea, that the, the coordinates, the geometric embedding is separated. So these are the points. And these are indexes into the points. So the first triangle here includes points 1, 2, and 3, index 1, 2, 3, and the next one, 3, 2, 1. And this is, you know, for those of you who are used to graph, we can put properties on the individual cells that make up a, uh, one of these regions. And so and I can also use them as labels in here. So here is a collection of two triangles, the hello world test. Um, here is a collection of two tetrahedra. So here's the points. And down here is the multi-tetrahedron. Tetrahedron 1 is point 1, 2, 3, 5, and so on. Here is a, well, apart from the hello world test, the uh, boundary mesh region. So I have a bunch of points. Um, then I can specify one boundary and another boundary. I can specify arbitrarily many boundaries. So these guys can have holes. The way what holes determine what's inside of a region is called the ray test. So if you put yourself at the point, um, you draw a ray out to infinity any direction you want. If the number of times you cross one of these boundary surfaces is odd, the point is a member of the set. If it's even, it's not. So if I put myself in here and I put a ray to infinity, I cross two boundaries. It's an even number, so I'm not in. That very same idea works in, in any dimension. So here's a case of 3D where we have a, a hole inside. So there are two surfaces. There's an outer surface and an inner surface. And the test for membership is exactly the same ray test. You draw a ray to infinity, and you count the number of times you cross the surface. So if I put myself in the middle here, and I draw a ray to infinity, I cross two surfaces, an even number, so I'm not in. Hence, it's a hole, a void. Okay? There are other kinds of holes that naturally come up. They're usually called tunnels, just because there's this distinction, right? You have tunnels and voids in 3D. And uh, you know, some, what do you mean by hole? Do you mean a tunnel? Does a donut have a, a hole in it, or a tunnel, or a void, or uh, anyways? 
This is a pretty complicated way to build them, but it's still very powerful to be able to do that. So most of the time, you're going to use other kinds of constructors to build these mesh regions. Um, you can build a Dailani uh, triangulation. It's called Dailani mesh, so it uses a, you know, it builds up this collection of simplexes. So simplex is the generalization of triangle or interval to any dimension, and um, this one builds up a collection of those. Voronoi, uh, which we'll see a little bit later, builds a, you know, each, for each point that you give here, it will give you the cell that is of set of points that are closer to that point than to any other point in the set. Okay, it's really an infinite region, so um, there's another argument that you can say which region you want to look at it, and, you know, mesh regions can only represent bounded regions. Convex hole mesh is, um, is effectively the, the outer surface of that Delaunay triangulation, and it, and it is a convex set. So, you know, surprisingly, guys. Um, now, another thing is that one way that we can build up mesh region is to discretize graphics. So graphics contain both piecewise linear primitives that can be represented exactly, and nonlinear primitives like disk and ball and cone and so on, and these guys need to be discretized to a certain resolution. There's also many other useful utilities in these guys that allow you to filter out, say, how finely you want to discretize. Now, so I told this guy to build a boundary mesh region. And so that will, if I have a big graphic scene with lots of things, with lines, and sometimes things are diagrammatic, you don't really want that to be geometry because it was just like an arrow to illustrate something. I mean, we can integrate over that arrow too, but it's just often you don't want to. It was just an illustration. So this one, that one would fish out all the full dimensional things because it's the only thing that can be represented with B-reps or boundary representations. Now, if we triangulate, we can fill out the interior by triangulating it. And this is making use of what's called the constrained Delaunay triangulation. We can get, there's a lot of functions that I won't show about ability to drill down into meshes, but we have other talks later in this conference that will go into those much more. And this gives you the number of points lines and triangles. So the number of cells of different dimensions, 0, 1, 2. If I have a disk, here is a more complicated implicit region. Um, if I run that, um, we, we can see how that um, that's, uh, comes out. And so these implicit regions can be quite complicated. In, you know, they have ability to describe fairly complicated sets. Um, you can just this highlight graph and other kinds of functions, we have a highlight mesh that allows you to style and, um, and illustrate and, uh, and, and so on. In this case, I, style, I tell it to style all the one-dimensional cells that are in there, and I want them to be red. So that means all the line boundaries. Final type of region. Is, um, is a derived region, and this is one thing that you will see grow a lot over the coming releases in Mathematica um, and Wolfram language. So there's Boolean operations, union intersection difference, symmetric difference. Symmetric difference is basically like an XOR of, of regions, you know, the things that are in, in one or the other, but not both. Or a general Boolean function. You can see that all, the bo you know, all of these Boolean operations are effectively defined by Boolean conditions, well, you can do it for any Boolean function. And we have a lot of them in Mathematica. Product is Cartesian product. Transformations by a, 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 a mapping, or the inverse of that, the inverse image, or the boundary of a region. OK. So let's do some, some simple examples here. There's a bunch of disks. And so here are you know, the four most common Boolean operations. Union intersection difference, symmetric difference. Um, let's look at some transformations. So here's a variety of um, affine transformations. And you know there's a huge library of, of affine and linear fractional transformations that you can do in Mathematica. It's a pretty rich set, and it will, we'll be enriching that too. Um, so um, this is what that one does. So right now, um, it's, it's sort of restricted to affine transformations for these mesh regions that will be uh, relaxed as we go forward. For the other kinds of regions, you can do any, any kind of transformation you want. Okay, so properties. 
Now, um, so a, a property is, is something that computes, it's like um, a statistic, if you like, if you think of uh, probability and statistics, what's the mean, what's the variance, what's, you know, some kind of property. So every one of our regions, they live in some space, and you've seen me showing mostly 2D and 3D, and so they live in 2D or 3D, but they can live in, in any D. The region itself has a dimension, and the dimension is determined by sort of the, the largest dimension a ball that you can put inside of it. So um, a curve, you can basically put a little interval ball, if you like, on it. So that's a 1D thing, and, and, and so on. That, <clears throat> that has some implications for, for, for instance, how we integrate. So if you tell in 2D to integrate over a curve, it will use a curve integral. It uses that dimension information to determine what to do. Um, so um, we have uh, membership properties. This asserts membership, and this tests membership and give conditions for membership. We have a lot of things. There are special names for 1D, 2D, you know, 3D. But generally speaking, you know, we can be any D, including 0D. Centroid gives a measure of what a center is of a region. It's one of many possible you know, centers. Um, Nearest distance and sign distance, the nearest point from a point to a region and what that distance is. So let's look at some examples. Okay, so here are some, some low dimensional examples. So here is the, um, um, here is the, along the um, x-axis here, this is the, the dimension. Along the y-axis is the embedding dimension. So here's a point in 2D. Here's a point in 3D. It's still a zero-dimensional object. Here's a curve in, one, in 2D and one in 3D. It's still a one-dimensional object. Here's a, an, a surface in 2D and 3D. It's a two-dimensional object. And here's a volume in 3D. It's a three-dimensional object. And I could have extended it because we, we do support uh, 1D embeddings, too. You know, 1D regions are perfectly good. 1D embedded regions. Okay, so here are some concrete examples. Um, just the, um, the <coughs> a disk, as we know, is, is a 2D thing, a circle, which is the boundary of that disk, is, I'm sorry, they're all embedded in, in, in 2D. The circle lives specifically in 2D, our circle does. Um, and the point, uh, this one, that has four dimensional sort of coordinates, it lives in 4D. Okay, but, but the actual dimensions are, the disk is 2D, the circle, which is the boundary of that disk, is, is a curve, so it's 1D, and the point, of course, is you know, a 0D object. Now, we use um, element, or we typically use the typesetting notation element of, um, to assert that a point is in a region, like so. Now I can use that, and we'll see that shortly, as a way to, to specify that I want to integrate over that region. And this one had some parameters in it, so the result has some parameters in it. If I want to test for membership, or I get conditions for membership, I can use that, you know, any of the regions that we've seen, four types, and I give uh, um, symbolic parameters here, I can get the actual condition. And you can see that in this case, we also get, in fact, the condition on the parameter coming out. That's an assumption. The disk assumes that we have positive radii disk guy, disks. OK. Now, if I, give, um, if I do the same region member what, without a second argument, then I will get a region member function that can then be applied to points. And that's very useful when you want to test membership many, many times. So um, it gives the same result as if I had given the point in that original function, but it provides this more efficient way, this more efficient representation that can be used. So here's an example where I generate um, a, a region, which is a convex hull, and I generate 100,000 points. And um, um, also, it, just instead of generating that region member function, if I give a long list, it will apply, it will first build that function, that region member function, then apply it in parallel in a listable way to all of these. This 
this last extension comes with 10.02. Um, in 10.00, it, it, uh, it's sort of a two-step process. And then I, I can visualize these uh, 100,000 points, green for the ones that are in the region, and red for the ones that are outside of the region. OK, so what about moment properties um, um, or, um, or integration-oriented properties? So we have special names that we all grew up with, like length, area, volume. And, but more generally, we have a measure function. And so the measure function will compute um, the, uh, the sort of the generalization of volume to, first of all, points. And what the generalization there means counts. That's the, the appropriate measure for 0D objects. And the generalization for volume for 4D, 5D, and so on. So it will look at your region and says, what's the maximal dimension? That, that is the dimension of your region. And then it will use the corresponding definition. Centroid uh, integrates sort of the, uh, the, the moment and divides by the, by the measure. Okay, so here are some examples. If you <coughs> the area of a circle is 2 pi, the, the arc length of uh, some implicit thing, and here we can see it's an ellipse. Um, it computes, if you give exact input, it tries to give exact outputs. If I had approximation on the inside, it, it would use approximate methods. But if I use exact input, you know, you get the real, real true thing. This is a perfectly good curve for us. Um, it's very much not manifold for those who cares about that. I, I found that most things in the world are not manifold, so. The area of a disk, these are things that we all know. Are, uh, that's a boundary mesh region. Um, the volume of a bowl, we know. Um, volume of, a, of some mesh region. But here's an example of a sort of a convenience. The n, if I give an integer argument to sphere, it will give me the n-dimensional unit sphere. So these are the volumes, oh sorry, the measure, which is the areas um, of the n-dimensional um, spheres up to dimension 10. I can use some other functions in Mathematica that we had for a while that looks like a sequence. So maybe I can identify what the general formula is from that. And, um, in this case, uh, find sequence functions is able to find it. But this, this, this was simple, and we know that, and you, you can look that up. But you can use that for many more general things, and it, it actually su works surprisingly well. OK, so the centroid thing gives you a sense of where the center is of a region. So as we know, the center of a disk is just the, the middle point that we use to specify it in, in Mathematica. Um, we can do center, centroids for, for anything. Now, in this case, I give the, the polygon that I gave here is not convex. And one thing that can happen that you should be aware of is that centroid doesn't necessarily lie in the region unless it's convex. Um, but again, you know, these mesh regions, they, 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 uh, they display themselves, but they're still regions. And so I can just use that as an argument into any function that works with geometry. And um, this is the center bunny. Okay, it's just more fun with cows and bunnies than <laughs> than than discs, you know. And we can sort of leave spherical cows. Um, okay, region nearest. So if I have um, if I have a point and a region, what's the nearest point in the region to that point? And what's the distance to that nearest point? And then something that's slightly more subtle, which is the sine distance, and if that's a point outside of the region, then it's the same as distance. If it's a full dimensional region, let's say a disk, then that's the distance to the complement to that disk. So it's the distance to the boundary. And it's negative when it's inside. And so it gives you a dif different name. Different domains have different names for these things. Sometimes it's called the depth of a point, that negative. OK. so. Again, um, you know, if you give these symbolic arguments to it, like we saw for member, we'll give you actually a closed form for it. Now, these can be pretty complicated, um, except for a disk and ball and so on. Here is, for instance, for a triangle. And um, you know, even that got sort of surprisingly complicated. But they're very fast, as you'll know. We spent a lot of time deriving these. Um, the, uh, Again, if I don't give a second argument, it will give you a nearest function, something that you can compute 
if you want to do this a lot, will provide an optimized form. And the ones that you can see what that optimized form would be when we have formulas, but for mesh region, it's not formula, it's a procedure. So if I apply that to a bunch of them, it, it will give me the nearest point for each and every one. Okay, so distance, as we said, is the distance to that nearest point. Um, and it works pretty much the same way. If I don't give a second argument, it will give me a distance function, apply that in this case, and I can plot these ISO distance curves from the triangle. So the triangle sits here in the middle somewhere, and I'm at distance 0 0.25, 0.51. Or I can do the same in 3D. Um, should be pretty fast. And uh, the style sheet has some weirdness. And um, so, um, so now we come to, so that's properties. There's a few more, but those are the most important ones. Um, now, solvers is one thing that makes it a lot of richness to use geometry, and it gives a lot of enhancements and enrichments to the solvers themselves. The one important thing that, um, that we finished, but we didn't document for 10.0.0, but it will be part of 10.0.2 that we're about to drop is to be able to plot over regions. You still saw examples of us doing it in, in, um, in the literature, but it was sort of more select examples. And for 10.02, it will work really well. So I kind of have stylized versions here. So you can plot a function, and you just indicate where you, know, where you want that lie, variable to lie, what region. Same idea works for integration, symbolic and, and numeric integration over region, same idea. We can solve PDEs, and there was a great talk yesterday, and there'll be another, there'll be a workshop on it this afternoon, and so on. We can solve PDEs over regions. Um, and um, we can even solve with, you know, um, maintaining parameters in that PDE and do sensitivity and other things. We can optimize over region. This is a little bit more general than it seems here, because I can have any number of extra region constraints like this in my constraint list but I wanted it to look similar, so this, this is the way it looks. So I can optimize over a region, and I can solve equations and inequalities over regions. So that alone, so here's about 30 different solvers that now today work on regions. Okay, so here are some examples of, of plotting. So I give a bunch of intervals here. Um, that's, that's what it comes out to. And who said that the sine function wasn't monotone? I mean, it, it's the, you know, depending on what domain of definition you use, right? So, um, or I plot sort of a function over a disk, or uh, I can do these vector plots, like stream plot over a disk, and so on. It works with any region, any of the things that you've seen me show, okay? Likewise, we already seen a lot of examples of integrate because I've been using it sort of as a hello world thing. One thing to remember though is this, what, what I said, like in the case here where I give it, this is a, this, this, this circle lives in 2D, but it's a curve. And what integrate will do, it will do a curve integral in this case. So if I integrate one over a curve, it will give me the, the measure of it, in this case the, the length. If I integrate over a disk, it will do a 2D integral. Uh, if I integrate over a ball, a 3D integral, and so on. This is, again, a perfectly good curve to us. Um, very much not manifold. Um, and this is the length of it. Um, this is actually, it looks like a volume. You can't tell the difference between surfaces and, and volumes. This one is the surface. Um, so this is the, the surface uh, area of that cow. This is a volume. And we'll see more of this, this guy a little bit later. It has tunnels going in each and every direction. So that is integration. PDEs, I'm not doing it justice here at all, but we had a talk yesterday. We'll have a workshop this afternoon. We, 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 you know, and I, I know you guys are really interested in it. And so if I solve, this is a Poisson equation. I give some um, very kind of basic Dirichlet conditions. I want it to be zero at the boundary. You can see that here in the plot. And then I just solve it over a disk. So I can now plot it over a disk, which we just learned. 
I do, um, the previous talk, John talked about PDF import. Well, we can, we can import the outlines of fonts. And that's a perfectly good mesh region or boundary mesh region. So I did that and there it is. And now I can solve the same equation effectively over, um, over Wolfram. And so here's the Poisson equation solved over Wolfram. I tweak the, the right hand side to get them to droop the right amount. <laughs> okay. We can optimize over regions or with region constraints. So here's one of these 18 optimization functions. I'm, I want to just minimize, I want to find a minimizing point for that over a disk. And there it is. I can find a maximizing point. And if we show that, um, I think that this is useful first time you start with teaching optimization to show the level curves and this is the, um, the minimum and as the maximum attained at the boundary. These things get very easy to explain now, whether it's just class or just a report or something. Let's take two other regions and I want to find the minimum distance between these two regions. So I have one point being region one, the other one in region two. What is the minimum distance? And one thing that you see me use here is these symbolic vector variables. So notice I didn't do all the components here. These are 2D regions. And what I get out is the, the results, the two points, or I can find a maximum distance. And here is a visualization of that. So that's the two minimum, the minimum distance points and the maximum distance points. Uh, last group of solvers are equation and inequality solvers. So let's say that I want to find the intersection between two lines. So here is line one, line two, and just find me the x's and y's that, that cross it. And here's a visualization of that. Or a line and a circle. In this case, I switch over to use these vector, symbolic vector variables. And there are those, and that's an illustration of that. Or I want to find the intersection of three spheres. So I do, um, here's my three spheres and I want to find a point that's in all of them. That turns out to be two of them, the way I place the spheres, like so. Okay, so here's what we've done. You know, you now know everything, okay? <laughs> this is the whole thing, this is the story, this is, this is it, okay? So just to, to recap where we were at, you know there are regions, and we saw there are four kinds of regions, four kinds of properties, although they have many more actual concrete properties, and um, five kinds of solvers. And there are many concrete solvers, like 30 of them. So now I wanted to switch over to sort of use it a little bit, because I wanted to get to this point as fast as possible, because you kind of need all of it, you know? Um, and that's one I want to illustrate in the second part. So here's a, let's, let's, let's study a topic, you know, what, the, what is this thing called Hausdorff distance between regions? Okay, so the Hausdorff distance is defined as, you know, it needs to be symmetric, so it's max of two things, and this thing here is called the directed Hausdorff distance from a region A to a region B, and it's given, you know, it's given basically as I'm going to minimize <coughs> the distance between points where I pick one in A, and I'm going to take the maximum of that. So I'm going to illustrate and compute with the functionality that we have. So let's do it. Let's, let's try to understand this concept with just two regions, uh, two triangles. This is the way they look. So the red one is A, the blue one is B. Now, <coughs> I want to, first of all, the innermost thing here is the minimum, right? Well, that's exactly sort of region distance. So let's use region distance. That's that inner infimum here. Now, let's, let's just stop a little bit and plot it, okay? So remember what we do now, we plot um, for all the points in B, which is all the blue points. So we plot the minimum distance from all the points in B to the set, the red set. And when I overlap, of course, it's gonna be zero, right? Because there's one point right under it. And here, they're outside. And, 
and here we use the ability to plot over regions, and you can see that when I'm sticking out, it's going you know, more than zero. So now we use the fact that we can optimize over regions. So we compute the max value, and we've computed that directed Hausdorff distance, which turns out to be a half, and which now we, we built the intuition, we could probably have guessed that. It's kind of that half up there, right? So fine, um, you know, one thing that we do know if the directed Hausdorff distance is some number, epsilon, is that we know that that set, that second set, is included in a slightly enlarged version of A. In fact, it's enlarged exactly by epsilon, the distance epsilon. So here's the visual of that. So we know that this blue triangle is included in, if I just enlarge that red set, the red region by, by a, a half, distance a half, um, it's included. So fine, then we can compute it the other way around. So we get the other directed distance, which turned out to be a little bit bigger, um, and now we can compute the Hausdorff distance. So this is just using sort of a first round of using the functionality to do something kind of easy to illustrate and, and easy to understand. Okay, so here's another sort of just Relatively, you know, simple, straightforward. So we, we want to define a, a, I'm going to define eventually as a mesh region, but first as an interval, a Cantor set. So Cantor set is defined, you're starting with the, uh, the zero, 1 interval, and then you keep on removing the middle third of the set that you have left. So this is what I'm saying here. You know, so if I have this region, I'm just going to take, th that's the first middle third, the first third and the last third, and I skip the middle one. Fine, we can define that easily enough in just using Mathematica programming. Just apply my rules. And so here's, the, you know, I start with the zero, 1 interval, then I remove the middle third, and if I plot a few of them, it looks like this. So this is using a new function in 10, number line plot. Okay, um, great. Um, what's the, you know, what's the length of these, these you know, step n cantor sets? Well, I can just ask for region measure. I could have uh, called arc length, which is the same thing in this case. And um, I get the sequence of numbers, and let's guess at what that is. And then we say, oh, I'm stupid. I could have just guessed that right away, probably. But that's a good way to build intuition and realize that you're stupid. You didn't realize, you know, <laughs> you, know you check it. Okay? But so let's just generalize it a bit, you know, and so there's some you know, someone came up with this, of course, is like, well, why don't we take Cartesian products and we get um, what's called Cantor dust instead. So fine, we have Cantor region, so just let's take the product and we get Cantor dust. Okay, so this is what they look like. This is K here is what step in that Cantor construction and this is the dimension. So in 2D, if we do that for steps one, two, three, this is what they look. So I, I remove the middle third um, and then took the Cartesian product, and then I removed the middle third again, and so on and so on. And here's what it looks like in 3D. These are all perfectly good regions. They, there's nothing wrong with them. Now, we could play that same trick that we did for intervals, and we'll realize we're stupid again, but it's, it's you know, it's okay. So uh, we, we compute the, the measure of it, so the areas. Um, Want to have rational numbers for this guy, and let's guess it. And we see that this is effectively sort of that two-thirds squared, right? The four-ninth, you know, in every dimension. Or we could play the same trick in 3D and compute it again. And apart from the fact that it flips it upside down, it's, you know, two, two times two times two divided by three times three times three. That's K. Then we, you know, since we're playing, like, let's just generalize it a little bit and take, why don't we just, why do we have to have the same step canter? Because visually these are kind of interesting, right? So if I do um, the Cartesian product of canter region in step two or step three and step one, you get sort of, you know, you get whole families of these um, interesting, um, you know, creatureoids. Okay. So let's use, again, the, the, the functionality that we have to construct a, a, another region, and this is something called Seidel's polyhedron. Um, I just saw a picture of it, and I said, we gotta construct that. That looks really interesting. So the idea is this thing has tunnels that go in every which direction, 
and they never cross. Okay? So we're going to use the tools we have to build this up. <coughs> and so one thing that the way, you know, one way, and there's ma probably many, many ways to do this. I have no idea. But, but one way to do it is to think of it as just, just like a Rubik's Cube kind of filled with, uh, with uh, cuboids, right? And we're going to preserve some cuboids, and we're going we're gonna to re just remove some cuboids for the tunnels. So that's the idea I'm going on. But that means we can use grids and arrays to generate this whole pattern, and then finally we have sort of a mesh region at the end. One little thing that we need along the way is to be able to figure out what's the position in a sort of a, in this case, a 3D array um, when we flatten it. And if I flatten a 3D array um, position, this position, I1, I2, I3, and if I dimension D1, D2, D3, will transform into this new position. Okay? That's how flatten works. And you kind of just work that out. So this is what this function index flatten actually computes. And so if I index flatten this, this just gives me that formula back that we saw. And so if I do, here is an array. It's dimension 2, 3, 4. If I pick out the part number 1, 3, 2, I get that guy. If I first flatten it, if I first flatten it, and then I use my, my flattened index position, I get the same thing. This is what I wanted. It's just a little utility, okay? Now, I can just generate a giant table here of, of grid positions. So this is my kind of random embedding of it. And then the hexahedron, which I want to use to build up the cells in the mesh region, has this particular ordering of vertices. So I need to abide by that when I package them up as hexahedra. I do that, um, this routine, and now I have something that's actually much more general than for a Seidel uh, polyhedron. I have something that can work for any volume mesh built out of cubes. You know, so if, if I want to build a maze out of cubes, for instance, I can do that now, but we're not, we're doing the Seidel one. Okay. <laughs> so here I give it a 3D array, and um, so here is, it's a, you know, great. I kind of, I get a hole. So um, we have other things that generate these kinds of arrays, right? This is the evolution of a 2D cellular automata for some steps. Fine. That's a perfectly good mesh region now that I can do things with. But a little bit of experimentation, you realize that this is the actual 3D array that you want for the, in the side out case. So it's a periodicity, it's basically periodic, um, so some kind of periodic function. I, I'm not going to go into it more, but I'm using this array grid mesh constructor. Just thought about that, right? So then here is the first simple case, and this looks promising. This looks kind of like that side L thing. And if we compute um, something else that I showed you was one of the mesh constructors, I can represent any full dimensional mesh region by just using its boundary surface. So I compute that here. And I adjust some styling using highlight mesh because I don't really want to see the edges now, for instance. So no edges, and I want the, the 2D faces to be transparent. And then we get the result that we started, that you saw me there. And if I push it a little bit farther and, and so on, you, you get that. So that's an example of just using the toolkit that's there to do something. Um, OK. Next exploration. So. Um, this is for, um, to, to generalize that, let's, let's try to generalize the idea of, of Voronoi <coughs> diagrams. So Voronoi diagram, which is Voronoi mesh in Mathematica, because it produces that structure, it can maintains all the connectivity structure that you need. But the each cell is defined basically exactly what I said before, which is that here are the points, and each other things in this cell are points that are closer to this point than to any other point. So specifically, I can define it like this. You know, those are the points that are closer to, to my point, pi, than to any other one that's not i. Okay? That, that's not pi. And, and that's exactly, so really, <coughs> the Voronoi diagram is really sort of kind of like, um, region nearest function. 
it's sort of a compiled form of Regis nearest function. And that was sort of how it kind of came up, right? And we can use this very symbolic definition that I gave here and using region plot for those inequalities, and you will see it returns, you know, it's exactly the same cell structure. Okay. Well, region nearest and region distance and so on, they need to sort of figure out what what transformation, what projection function to use for each subregion to map to the closest point in the cell. So, um, so in the case of Voronoi diagrams, that projection function is just pick the point in the cell. Okay, so it's a particularly simple projection function. Um, so I'm going to have something here that sort of scrapes the, the values and the conditions out of piecewise. So if I do region nearest for a bunch of points, the same points we looked at now, I get a piecewise function like this, and it says this is sort of a logic description of that cell, and this is the nearest point. Let's look at the, those cells. Again, we get back the Voronoi diagram. Okay. But let's, but we need to make this work for any region, not just point sets. Okay, so let's do one, one simple sort of extension of that is a triangle. So if we compute it in the symbolic form, we get, um, you know, we get the conditions for, for when some particular projector, so if I'm in the triangle, it's the point itself. And here, um, let's say, where is this? This is for, let's, let's point one out here. So that second cell, that's probably this cell here, okay, when I'm below it, then I'm going to go to, so any point here is going to project onto that edge, edge there is what this, this formula says. It's going to be x, the same x value, but y is going to be 0. So that, that, that this structure is sort of the, uh, the generalized Voronoi diagram for a triangle. It gives you all the cells that you need to, to and the projectors that you need for the different cases. Now this, and so you, if you explore the basic regions, you'll find all of these things derived and computed. So if I do it for tetrahedron, it gets a little bit more complicated because um, I have a few more, um, you know, I, I need to take into account all the points, all the edges, all the faces. So it, it breaks down into a few more cases. And if I visualize the cells, so this is again, this is like the generalized Voronoi diagram for tetrahedra, in this case, the one that you saw. And um, here you see it. And um, if we do that for um, a, that is annoying. OK. If we do that for a bunch of the matters, and, and, and you can play with it yourself, this is for, um, this is for a half line. This is the ISO distance curves, and these are the cells. This is the corresponding Voronoi cells. This is for line segment, and this is the corresponding cells. This is for a half plane, and the corresponding Voronoi cells in 3D. And this is just fun. This is almost intoxicating when you start playing with this. Um, this is the triangle we saw, or polygram, um, parallelogram, hexahedra, um, things in 3D. Um, can even do it for nonlinear primitives. So um, this is why this is why the disk is so easy. The cell structure here, we, we all know it. It's like you're in the disk or you're outside. Okay, we can do that. Um, this is for uh, for a disk sector. This is for an ellip ellipse sector, ellipsoidal sector. Or uh, these are um, is for a cylinder. Um, we get sort of one region here, here up on top here. We're going to project onto the top flat of the of the cylinder, or a, or a cone. Okay. Last exploration. So, <coughs> oftentimes it's really good to have a simpler region that approximates your region in some sense. And if you know that it's an upper approximation or lower approximation, it, you can make more firm statements. So I'm going to just show using the tools we have to derive some upper approximations. So, so let's use a, um, a cow. Okay, we have a few of these bounds, bounding regions built in. So you have some, it's one of the properties I didn't show, but we can compute a bounding box. It's called region bounds. Um, gets you the bounding box. We show that as a cuboid, and this is good if we ship it by FedEx or something. <laughs> okay. 
We have other ways of, of, of wrapping it up or bounding it is that I take the points out and I can compute the convex hull, which I saw in the beginning there. So this is kind of like shrink wrapping it. But we can get all kinds of other things that might be useful for our computation. So here I'm going to find a ball. So in order to do that, I'm going to use our optimization function and I'm going to try to find a good starting value. So a good starting value is to just put a ball around that box, the bounding box, because then I have something that I know is valid. It's, it's too big of a ball because it's not the minimum volume, but it's, you know, it's valid, right? So this is what this initial thing does here. It's like I take that box, uh, compute the, the, the middle point of that, that's going to be the center of my ball, and then I compute sort of half the diagonal as the radius for that ball. That's going to be my initial values. And then I just want to minimize the volume of the ball such that every point that's in that cow <coughs> is in the ball. Okay? And fine, we compute that, we get um, a result uh, which in this case is um, the center, the first three is the center, and the last one is the radius, and here is a balloon. You know, this is our nicely packaged cow. Or we can do, um, we can save on material by using an ellipsoid. So it's the same idea, right? I'm using the same starting values. And um, so this gives us the, the minimum volume ellipsoid instead, the axis aligned ellipsoid, so it's not can, you know, can be, so now we have shrink wrapped it in an ellipsoid instead. There are lots of these. Okay, so that was the set of um, explorations where I wanted to use the framework and combine them in some ways, still hopefully easy and, and accessible. Um, so here's what we've seen, you know, it's regions, properties, solvers, regions, properties, solvers. Okay, it's the framework, and here's we break them down, and we've seen some uses of it. Now, what's the future? So I talked a little bit about 1002 for this release. So this support for visualization functions that you saw me use, um, it's about 10 of them. Um, that's going to be available and documented in 1002. Support for optimization is, was already there in 1000, but we've included now for mesh regions, so any region now works. Um, anything geometric searching and distance, meaning nearest and distance and so on for mesh-based regions is, is vastly improved performance-wise. Um, 2D discretization has been vastly improved. Application, the examples have been um, greatly expanded and there are many sort of robustness, bugs, um, other things that, that, that are also performance. In the future, so all of what you've seen here today will sort of improve. There will be more kinds of region. There's nothing that limits us from having a, a CAD region, a, a boundary represented with NURBS boundary surfaces. We don't have it today, but nothing prevents us from doing that. You can see how that would just slot into the framework or any other kind of, 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 of region family. Um, same game thing goes for properties. There are many more properties that you probably want widely available, and they come from different kinds of domains. And the uh, same goes for solvers. Um, and you will see a lot more interaction with the outside world, and that includes other systems, but nearby are things like 3D printing and 3D scanning to make that really, really streamlined and really simple, and whole new categories of things. And if you want to learn more, um, there are the four talks here in the conference, talks and workshops. Um, there's also many talks that already are using geometry. I think the talk following this one, for instance, will be, and, and I, I, I know a handful of others beyond this that already are using it. Or the thing to do here is to interact with the team while you're here. Um, so this is, uh, so you can identify them. Um, <laughs> Adam, Nina, Peritosh, Charles, Dylan, Rob, Ulysses, and Oliver. And some of these you've already seen giving talks in the ones that I saw before. There's also plenty of other material. There is all these, um, these marketing pages. This, this overview page for geometry is pretty much kind of like the first part of this talk. And, and uh, 
But then there's sort of more in-depth for basic and formula regions and data and mesh regions um, and derived regions. And then we made a special one for, for PDEs. Um, although, so PDE is one of these um, which has been a very important driver for the development of what we've done in geometry and will be doing in geometry for that matter. Um, and, um, but also an important contributor because being able to do that trivially is, is kind of important. Plenty of guide pages. The geometric computation is the overall sort of introduction to the thing um, that gives you that whole picture that I've tried to communicate to you here today. And from here you can get to everything. And that's also a basic tile on the help um, viewer. Now, how do I delete this? God. Um, then, um, then there are various kinds of alternate introductions, you know, for plane geometry, uh, solid geometry, and then you, you're going to recognize, after this talk, you recognize all these topics, and you can kind of guess what it is. The stuff here is complete, um, and uh, that's all I have to say.